Today is Friday, August 8, 2014, the 220th day of the year. There are 145 days remaining until the end of 2014. This week in 1909, Alice Hoyler Ramsey and three friends become the first women to complete a transcontinental auto trip, taking 59 days to travel from Manhattan to San Francisco. In 1909, women not encouraged to drive. America is a lot like Saudi Arabia in those days with regard to women's rights. You got to remember, women didn't vote or hold elective office in 1909. None of that was possible till the 19th Amendment in 1920. A huge struggle to get to that point. If you're a woman and you want to work outside the home, you can be a shop girl, which was a decent way to meet a husband, or you can teach school and avoid marriage altogether. The military, the factory, ridiculous. Women didn't make inroads into manufacturing work until World War II. If you've got any talent at all, you can be a showgirl. Well, maybe you can't be a showgirl. All right, go ahead then. Shake that thing. Oh, uh, you mean, uh, like this, huh? Right? All right, really, that's, that's, that's quite enough. Huh? Right? No, no, seriously, don't, uh, right? don't make me come over there. Cripes, it was, it was your idea. Well, it was a bad idea, okay? Man, don't, don't ever do that again. Okay, okay. So, it was kind of a big deal when Alice Hoyler Ramsey, a 22-year-old housewife and mother from Hackensack, New Jersey, set off from Manhattan on June 9, 1909, with three non-driving passengers, two older sisters-in-law, and a friend for companionship and ballast to drive 3,800 miles across America to San Francisco, where they arrived to much acclaim 59 days later on this day, August 8, 1909. To be fair to the sexists of those days, 105 years ago, the trip was a publicity stunt by the Maxwell Briscoe Motor Company, which supplied the car, a brand new green Maxwell touring car, beautiful car. In Nebraska, Mrs. Ramsey crossed paths with law officers on a manhunt for a desperate murderer whom Mrs. Ramsey and her companions might or might not have given a lift to when they picked up that hitchhiker. She got a bad case of bedbugs from a hotel in Wyoming. A hunting party of curious Native American gentlemen on horseback surrounded the Maxwell in Nevada with their bows drawn. Of those 3,800 miles traversed by Mrs. Ramsey on her pioneering journey, only 152 were on paved road. She followed AAA maps, not always accurate, but the ladies also followed telephone poles. They figured the ones with the most wires led to bigger towns. Mrs. Ramsey liked the West Coast and remembered it so well that in later years she lived out in West Covina, near Los Angeles. She made about, oh, 30 cross-country trips in subsequent years along ever-improving roads. AAA named her Woman Motorist of the Century. In the Y2K, she was the first woman inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame. She died at 96 years of age in 1983. In 1930, the last confirmed lynching of blacks in the northern United States occurred on August 7 in Marion, Indiana. A uh, local studio photographer, Lawrence Baitler, takes a snapshot of the event. Two men, Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith, beaten and hanged by their necks from a tree, surrounded by a large mob of men, women, children. One man with a clipped mustache, bareheaded in the foreground, gazes into the camera lens and points to the hanging men who are suspects in an alleged robbery, murder, and rape. The alleged rape victim later recants as she lied about being assaulted. The mob breaks into the jail where the men are being held. They drag the suspects out of their cell and into the street. One of the suspects tries to get away. They break his arms. Lynching is defined as extra-legal trial and punishment by an informal group. It refers to informal public executions by a mob, mostly by hanging. Between 1882 and 1968, nearly 3,500 African Americans and 1,300 whites are lynched in the United States, mostly between 1882 and 1920. The item is only slightly disingenuous. It's not quite accurate to describe the events of the evening of August 7, 1930 in Marion, Indiana as the last confirmed lynching, maybe in the North, taking into account the murder on August 28, 1955, of Emmett Till, 14, who, for the alleged crime of speaking to a white woman, was beaten and shot through the head, then tied to a cotton gin and dropped into the Tallahatchie River near Money, Mississippi, by two white residents, Roy Bryant, J.W. Milam. It doesn't take into account the killing of James Cheney, 21 years old, a civil rights worker from Meridian, Mississippi, who together with Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner was murdered by the Ku Klux Klan on June 21, 1964, then buried in an earthen dam, undiscovered for 44 days. Nor does it take into account the murder of James Byrd Jr. on June 7, 1998, who was tied to and dragged behind a pickup truck 
for three miles along a concrete road in Jasper, Texas. It's a good thing we don't do this anymore. On this day in 1974, the 37th American President Richard Milhouse Nixon, in a nationwide television address, announces his resignation from the office of the President of the United States, effective noon the next day. To date, Nixon's the only president to resign the office. Aside from that, he's remembered for his foreign policy achievements most notably for traveling to China in 1972, also with Dr. Kiesinger for conducting secret war in Cambodia, and for his heavy aerial bombardment of North Vietnam, the so-called Christmas bombings, from December 11 to 29, 1969, under the codename Operation Linebacker 2. Nixon, he's a sports fan, loves sports metaphors, also bourbon. Peruvian-American author Carlos Castaneda writes, A man goes to knowledge as he goes to war, wide awake, with fear, with respect, and with absolute assurance. Going to knowledge or going to war in any other manner is a mistake, and whoever makes it might never live to regret it. From Rutland, Vermont, this is Richard Alcott speaking.